Hello everyone, um, my name is Steve Gwynn, um, I work at Movement Strategies and today I'm going to be talking about modelling and mapping people movement in hospitals, uh, especially focusing on the importance of subject matter expertise and how that gives us access to different way, different types of results that can be presented. The work here was uh, produced by myself and my three co-authors, uh, Aoife Hunt, Simon Way and Bashar Kabbalan. And we're going to be talking about the modelling process, especially the complexity of healthcare, key modelling activities and how this contributes to the types of results that can be produced. I'll then go through some example modelling applications uh, and then uh, derive some conclusions. Broadly speaking, the modelling process starts with uh, a real world situation or condition in which we're interested. So it may be that we're interested in evacuating a particular building, a hospital. We initially have to build an understanding uh, of those conditions, the thing that we're trying to model. And we might um, gather evidence directly, data and theory describing the key components. It may be that there are regulations and guidance that prescribe some of the things that we, uh, we're interested in. So it may be that guidance tells us we must assume people move at a certain speed. There may be project requirements. So a client may want us to look at particular scenarios or where there are gaps we may need to employ engineering judgment. This forms our set of assumptions and data with which we can then configure our model. Once we've identified these factors, the factors that tell us the initial conditions and how they, how they evolve during the, uh, the modeling process, we then need to develop a set of scenarios. Uh, again, some of these may be prescribed, but others might be determined by us and, and, and uh, liaising through liaising with the client and so on to identify what is a representative set of scenarios for this particular application. We then need to build a conceptual understanding from our um, data, theory and assumptions on how people might respond in a, to a particular scenario. Uh, and that forms our core model before it's implemented into a platform, be that platform an engineering calculation or a simulation platform. Uh, and that platform then enables us to generate quantitative output. It's my contention that there is a tendency or at least a temptation to go too quickly to the implementation phase. And this is particularly challenging in a hospital uh, uh, environment because of the complexity of the scenarios involved. And I think this tendency is damaging in, in two ways. Firstly, we may not have a sufficient understanding or a demonstrated understanding of those real world conditions as described in our conceptual model. And we may be missing the opportunity to generate lots of valuable insights and results uh, along the way, along the modeling process by jumping over the conceptual modeling process uh, stage too quickly. The movement of staff and patients uh, around a hospital in an emergency or non-emergency scenario is complex. They're making use of convoluted and specialised spaces, each of which may have access uh, issues. There's a dependency, a greater dependency of patients on staff than may other, otherwise be the case in other buildings. The, the, uh, a demographic shift with a greater proportion of people with reduced mobility and therefore reliance on assistance uh, devices, movement devices that may require staff assistance. All of this complexity amplifies the importance of subject matter expertise on, on how we expect people to perform and, and, and the dynamics that are produced. But it also uh, uh, provides an opportunity for more valuable insights and feedback to be provided as part of the analysis. So in reality, how do we fit this modeling process to the problems that we face and the projects that we face? So firstly, we need to fill the gaps, if possible, 
in our understanding of our core subject matter, so the staff and patient response. And to do that, we might in, uh, engage in data collection, whether it's looking at CCTV footage, using um, Bluetooth or cellular uh, data, um, using sensors or actually using manual observations. And then we might compile that with our existing understanding of uh, uh, patient and staff response to form a good picture of both the initial conditions and what we might uh, expect of people. That then evolves into developing a logic of what we can expect of people, the types of decisions we expect from them and the actions that they might take, a qualitative analysis to produce that conceptual model of how we go from the initial conditions to a later state. We can then use that to make some estimations of the conditions that might be produced, even before we engage in quantitative analysis. So this might produce flow maps or, or detailed timelines, and we could overlay those on uh, the structural designs to provide qualitative insights, which may in and of itself be of value to different clients. And finally, we might embed that qualitative understanding into a quantitative platform, be it a spreadsheet or a simulation tool, to provide um, additional outputs, uh, insights, and potentially to suggest further data collection activities should additional scenarios be required. I'm just going to cycle through a, a couple of examples for each of those stages of the modelling process. So firstly, we might have the opportunity to collect data on uh, the people within the building. We may not always have this opportunity if the building doesn't yet exist or if there are access issues. But occasionally we might be able to conduct observations, um, examine existing CCTV footage and so on, and uh, conduct surveys of people as they enter and move around the building. Now this might give us insights into the initial conditions, where people are, the number of people in, in, uh, in the structure, what they're doing and the demographic uh, of that population and in this instance their ability to move around the space so and their degree of movement impairments for instance um, so it gives us that initial baseline level of understanding um, but it may also give us some insights into the type of actions that are performed um, and the local consequences of those actions uh, to the conditions produced inside the hospital so the routes that people use, for instance. So this data in and of itself may be an, a valuable insight for the client. They, it may tell them things about the population in the building and their behavior that they may not already know because it's a hugely complex and fluctuating, fluctuating uh, situation. Now, collecting data is an extremely challenging task. Possibly even more challenging is compiling the data and evidence that you collect and compiling it with the theories and data, data sets that are already out there and then producing a uh, conceptual understanding of what you can expect of staff and patients during uh, operational or emergency movement. And that is then responsible for the tasks that they perform and the likelihood of certain activities taking place during your, your modeling process, during your simulation of the real world conditions. Now this can take several forms. So here we have a, a logic chart showing the decision making process at various points, or that may tr translate into a timeline, for instance, and that timeline of events could be an individual timeline. So what a certain member of staff might be required to do, or it could be a sort of a process level timeline like uh, where we're trying to form a timeline for the event. So similar to the types of things you might see in an ASET, RSET comparison. And the, the, the level at which you operate will be reliant on the data that's available the, and, and also the types of granularity that you need to provide in the results uh, for the, for the uh, client or for the in third party. Now, these are fundamental because these are the core processes that need to be reflected in whatever model is being used. These are the stages that an individual or a population needs to 
progress through in order to uh, meet their goal. And that then needs to be reflected uh, in the model that is being applied. So the next piece of analysis is to see how that um, decision making uh, interacts with the building itself and the procedures that are in place. And the, one of the primary ways in which that takes place is the movement of people around that space and the routes that are used. So this gives invaluable insight into both the processes, the movement processes that need to be uh, represented and the various um, components that might be used. So it could be corridors or stairs or lifts. Um, uh, and also where flows, uh, the loading levels that are present on certain flows and also where those flows might interact. So it's basically how that decision making logic um, procedures and timelines that were highlighted in the last stage interact with the space being examined. And of course, this might vary as different design variants are looked at and different procedures are being tested as part of the uh, analytical process. The uh, subject matter expertise that uh, we looked at in the previous two slides is also required to um, generate scenarios and select scenarios. These are formed from the factors shown here, which are a composite of uh, uh, questions associated with the, the project and from the client, and also factors associated with the initial conditions present in the scenario and how they may evolve, in addition to the indicators that's needed to, 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 uh, to be reflected in the output. And the, the uh, ability to represent a scenario will be, will be uh, reliant on the evidence, the data that's available. If we don't have sufficient evidence, either currently or historically through theory and the historical data sets, then it's very challenging to represent that scenario. And also how we're using the model. Are we genuinely predicting certain conditions such as the use of different routes, or are we enforcing the use of those routes to see the, only to see the consequences? So that is less data intensive in the sense that we don't have to predict use of certain routes, but we would need to look at more scenarios to incrementally change that those assumptions to establish the sensitivity. Um, the si similar considerations also affect our selection of a model. So if we don't have uh, data at the level of the individual or the, um, out the scenario is driven by a particular process as opposed to individual actions, um, then, then we may uh, select uh, uh, an engineering calculation. If we do have a refined understanding and sufficient evidence, we can uh, configure and employ a simulation tool, although typically we might even combine the two to cross-reference the results or uh, even use an engineering calc to get a high level understanding and then use the simulation tool to dig down. These produce uh, results that might be, uh, as you can see here on the right, a sort of standard type of evacuation curve, or we could compile the results into a more innovative uh, dashboard which, which uh, presents assumptions, qualitative understanding, uh, qualitative analysis, and then quantitative analysis in the same context. In addition, should we use a simulation tool, we can also get flow maps showing how people utilize the space, which is extremely useful for the client. And this mimics the qualitative approach that we adopted earlier, trying to map out flows and how they interact. And finally, Obviously, we can produce animations that reflects the, the, the local interactions and conditions produced. But the key element here is that the understanding of the subject matter drives the selection of the scenarios, the selection of the model, and then the configuration of those models. And the technical setting up of the model is only a relatively small part of that process uh, that comes at the back end. I'm now going to present a couple of uh, examples to demonstrate the different approaches that might be adopted and uh, given given the scenario requirements and the output that can be produced. In this first example, um, the building existed. It was in place. So, so we had the structure. Um, there was a limited understanding of 
the pr precise procedures procedures that are adopted throughout the building because of the complexity and scale of the space. Um, and there was a concern over the viability of the evacuation procedure given uh, uh, structural issues in the building. Um, we uh, applied um, engineering calculations to assess the full building evacuation that involved several thousand people who had a range of different movement capabilities. And as, says the, uh, as I said, the uh, objective was to establish the potential evacuation time and identify the factors that influenced it from, uh, uh, to allow the client to, to act on those, on those factors. We first developed um, uh, uh, a scenario level, if you like, a, a timeline to reflect the key components that might affect the evacuation of each each of the floors. So the initial delay, the time for staff to get to the patients, preparation time, horizontal uh, walk time, and then uh, um, movement of the, uh, the patients themselves. And this was done at the level of the subpopulation rather than individuals. And this uh, a range of scenarios were looked at that varied based on staffing levels, uh, maximum occupancy levels and the, uh, the, the, the different assumptions regarding horizontal and vertical evacuation. And results were presented in terms of the routes that were adopted and how the, the distances involved and the assumptions uh, uh, that underpinned those routes, which were very useful information to the client who hadn't thought of the evacuation process in that way. And then if uh, the more typical you know, a uh, clearance time of subpopulations from each floor, given the assumptions made. Um, so this was really assessing the robustness of the current evacuation approach and then providing the client with insights to allow them to modify that approach on an existing building to address these other external uh, structural concerns. Example two was a much more comprehensive and complex piece of work that involved a number of stages. Uh, this was focused on uh, an, the early stages of the design phase where the design of a new section of a building was still in flux. So part of this effort was to inform the ongoing design iterations. We needed to look at both circulation and evacuation to, again, to inform different aspects of the proposed design and the manner in which it interacted with these existing parts of the building. Um, in this instance, the client, again, didn't have a, a detailed understanding of how people accessed or used their, their building, either in, in, in circulation or in evacuation. So there was a concerted data collection effort to establish the arrival profile of people at the building, the uh, types of people that arrived, the groupings, the routes that were used, and the subsequent conditions that they produced. So even before we got to them, the, 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 the modeling component, the quantitative modeling component, the data collection effort and the, you know, the, the, the supporting expertise required uh, so provided a great deal of insights to the client on how the building was currently used, which allowed them to, to modify the uh, current operations, but then pr provided a foundation for us to project that use on um, the new build uh, based on the services that were provided and how we might translate that arriving population, departing pop population into subsequent scenarios. Once the data had been compiled, we could then build our qualitative understanding of uh, patient and staff movement and apply it to areas both in the existing and the new design to see how they interacted. And this allowed us to map uh, the flow of patients and staff given their expected use of uh, the various locations. And this provided the client with um, insights into loading throughout the building, when that might occur, the conflicts that might be produced, and then uh, requirements regarding the movement of certain services and the design that was in place. So this is way before uh, we got to any sort of uh, um, engineering or simulation work. So the next stage was then to conduct um, quantitative analysis to build on that. So again, that was uh, using both engineering calculations to look at uh, uh, services that were provided, 
processes, for instance, movement in lifts was initially done using engineering calculations and then uh, was cross-referenced with simulation work to ensure additional confidence in, in, in that process, but also to look at the movement of uh, 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 individuals throughout the structure uh, on a more refined level. data that was collected and the data that was generated by the uh, engineering and simulation uh, modeling, um, along with their understanding of the different types of people that might be present and the fluctuations of people throughout the building uh, during uh, operational uh, use of the structure, was presented in a simplified dashboard such that um, the various audiences in this, in, in this project, such as the uh, safety managers, architects, and so on, could see the implications uh, in, uh, from these different scenarios that were looked at um, in a, the, 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 the addressed the indicators that they were interested, the performance indicators that were interested in. So, for instance, it may be that we uh, one of the scenarios was looking at the loss of lift capacity or different size lifts or different uses of lifts and how that might influence wait times for staff and patients or the footprint of the queues that were generated. Now, some because this was uh, the design was still in flux, this enabled them to see how robust their design was to different projections of use throughout the space. So we changed, we, we, we developed a set of performance indicators that met their, their needs and that reflected core results in the uh, uh, um, modeling effort to enable them to act on the results as best uh, we could. This final example, uh, I think, is closer to a, a more uh, standard uh, use of a simulation tool, where we had an existing building, we uh, had a, a good understanding of the types of procedure that was present, the number of people that were in the space and the specific actions that they were expected to perform and had a reasonable data uh, set to support each of the constituent parts of that response. Um, the uh, client was interested in understanding the impact of different procedures and associated staffing levels on their capacity to perform an evacuation time. So we had a firm description of the space, which did not change. We had to establish individual timelines for different types of staff, um, which each of which had to be supported by existing data sets. And that allowed us to configure the uh, Pathfinder tool to reflect the actions of the staff in response to the various different types of uh, patients and their movement needs. So, so whether they could be evacuated in a bed or in a wheelchair, or ambulant. So this then allowed us to generate refined um, results. I've just shown a simplified evacuation curve here that allowed us to say when wards were cleared, when uh, um, stairs were cleared, and so on. And that allowed that the, the client the sufficient uh, um, comfort in understanding the impact of um, modifying their procedure and its, uh, and its effect on the overall evacuation time. So here we see an example of the detail of that simulation where uh, members of staff are moving different uh, uh, devices. Each device requires different staff activities and commitment, different numbers of people, different movement rates, and so on, different levels of preparation. But we would not have been able to reliably or credibly do this without a detailed understanding of the processes involved, um, sufficient data to support the simulation effort, um, and an understanding of how the timeline, the evacuation timeline evolved given the uh, known procedures that were gonna be employed. So although this sophisticated simulation effort, it can be seen here, actually the core component of this work was in developing that qual qualitative understanding in order to suitably uh, configure the tool and, and then apply it. To conclude, 
Hospital movement is incredibly complex, whether it's an evacuation or operational movement. We need sufficient expertise and evidence to understand the problem and the requirements and limitations of our modelling approach. Subject matter expertise is key to set scenarios, to select models and to interpret the results and understand their value throughout the modelling process. Valuable insights can be generated at multiple points in the process, combining collecting data, mapping existing processes and movement, developing patient and staff narratives and then combining that with numerical modelling outputs. Oftentimes we jump straight to the modelling outputs and then and ignore or uh, many of these other valuable insights. So our subject matter expertise is fundamental, both to ensure credible modelling and to enable a wider variety of output and insights to be produced. Thanks. All right, so we're live now. And so we'll just give people a minute to pop over from the stage and fill up the Q&A chat with questions. There we go. Starting to climb up now. You can see the little eyeball at the top of the. Oh, yeah. Where they're counting up. So welcome over, everybody. Quite intimidating to see that eye. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, welcome over uh, from the stage. If you have any questions for Steve on his talk or any other question you might have related to this field, you've got a good person to ask it. And the sounds of silence. <laughs> so, yeah, I always feel like that. OK, here we go. Uh, so uh, Steve, was there any cognizance to the varying staffing levels and whether they were the usual staff for the area or those brought in? I mean, well, firstly, uh, the, the, the discussion wasn't on one particular project, right? It was just on the, the process across a, a range of projects. And, and secondly, yes, one of the things that you could look at using this these tools is the impact of different staffing levels on performance it could also be as you rightly mentioned Ian the 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 sufficiency of their training or expertise with a particular uh, device so for instance if you if a device required a number of a specific number of people to operate it and you didn't have a num that number of of trained people then that would affect the use of that device in the evacuation and that can definitely be represented uh, inside uh, uh, simulation tools. So, so absolutely, and yes, on both counts, they're both they're very important factors, and and they can be taken into account in this process. But fundamentally, you have to be aware that they affect performance in the first place, which is obviously the case here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you define profiles of occupants in example one? Uh, what data did you use? So profiles, uh, it could be, for instance, the 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 first of all, the number. Then the uh, um, the uh, different types of patient, for instance, so their capacity to their mobility, uh, um, uh, their uh, requirement of of specific devices during an evacuation, their requirement of assistance, uh, their location within the hospital. So so uh, so, and by that I mean their distribution throughout the hospital. So obviously, different types of patients have different place, different demands on the space and di different demands on the resources or staffing and equipment and then that has implications for the procedure that's employed and the the overall uh, evacuation performance were there any particular data sources that you used and was that data collection time intensive that level of data gathering um so yes we tried to offer that initially we we approached the organizations involved and said where do you ex what's your expected patient load and uh, type and and you know you get some understanding of that based on the type of wards and the type of facilities that are in place but where that wasn't present and they were very honest about that in in most regards because of the fluctuating nature of the hospital population we collected it um it can be very challenging because obviously in those environments privacy is, is key so you don't always have access to the the sort of the the expected modes of data collection video etc it has to be a more manual process sometimes you do but um uh we we try to supplement existing understanding with data collection and then use that to build a, a better uh, um picture of the the numbers of people at certain points in the day who they are and then that gives us a better understanding of the initial conditions to simulate going forward 
Um, we have time for just another question here. Um, let's see, what would you, uh, what could you say about staff gender and could this have some kind of impact on the simulation results? So I think there's, there's several aspects to that, right? Which is the requirement of certain people in certain wards and uh, certain hospitals. So there may be um, requirements for people of certain genders in a specific type of ward which, uh, uh, you know, it could be like a maternity ward or a, 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 um, a ward that only deals with men, and, men, women and so on. Um, or it might be uh, issues of physicality, I guess, is, is also what you might have in terms of uh, issues of speeds, fatigues. Now, there's a huge distribution of that. So maybe gender is not the appropriate way of differentiating there. It's probably more to do with fit, fitness and individual strength. But yes, you can take into account the range of movement, physical and, and uh, uh, expertise capabilities. So that's really, I think, what you're, you're getting at there is, is that, that, that the range of different performance elements that you can then reflect in the, in the tool. Great, great. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, ask you if you don't, wouldn't mind in the session chat here to take a look through and if there's any of these other questions, there's just some we can't get to, if you can maybe just with text answer uh, those in chat, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> But otherwise, thank you very much for, for being a part of all of this and your time with the Q&A and your hassle with getting logged in and all of that. Really appreciate the effort uh, you went to here. So thank you, Steve, and we'll no see, you, uh, see you later. I'll, I'll answer these and then get back into the stage. All right, thanks, Steve.